Sitting in a shop in Tehran, Iran, the Persian rug depicted an ancient forest. Beautifully done, it recreated a scene in Switzerland. Mountains, a waterfall, a turquoise lake, forested hillsides, and an expansive blue sky dotted with clouds. This quarter, we will be studying another finely crafted masterpiece. This work is not the result of a brush on canvas, or a precisely framed photograph, or a skillfully woven carpet. Rather, it is the Word of God, as artfully expressed in the Gospel of John. Welcome to Whispering Hope. It's Tuesday morning. I know I'm not your normal Tuesday host, but nonetheless, I am here with Elder Jacqueline Gordon and Elder Andy David. And all week, we have been looking at the topic, Science of Divinity. Today, we focus on the healing of the blind man, part one. I'm going to invite both of these elders to greet us all here on Whispering Hope. And then Elder David, we're going to ask you to pray as we get ready for this wonderful discussion as we study the book of John, themes in the book of John. So Ellis, go right ahead. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. As usual, I'm happy to be here. Happy to be here with my colleagues and Whispering Hope family. And I know as usual, the Holy Spirit will indeed tabernacle with us and teach us so that we can be enriched and empowered to continue to live this Christian journey and to do as he bids us to do. Welcome again. Hey, good morning to Sister Challenger. Good morning, Elder Gordon. Good morning to all those who are listening to us this morning. I trust that we all are doing fine this morning. Again, I'm indeed grateful to be here to discuss the lesson. And I trust that as we discuss, as we deliberate, the Lord will indeed bless us all, as he usually does. And uh, David, can you pray? And so yeah. loving, Heavenly Father, we are so very grateful for this wonderful privilege that we could come together again to discuss your word. We invite your Holy Spirit, dear God, to come by this morning and to guide our deliberations. And may we all be blessed in the end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jesus' is divinity and the healing of the blind man, part one. I'm just going to ask both of you, if you see any connections between these two topics. As you get ready to dig deeper in the story of Jesus' healing of the blind man. So you're asking if we see any connections between signs of divinity and Jesus' healing of the blind man. Yes. Yes, indeed, there are connections. Now, Jesus' miraculous healing of the blind man indeed is a sign that he is indeed divine. He is indeed, he did have supernatural power. So there is a connection. And of course, the sign points to him being God, being creator. And so he is the creator of life. And I think specifically, as we go into Tuesday's lesson, we'll see something a little different where Jesus, as we all know, could have just spoken the word, which is what he did during creation week. He spoke the word and everything came into existence. The question is, why did Jesus took time to do what he did as we go on to Tuesday? So I think it wraps and it ties in with signs of divinity. Everything throughout the lesson will point to the fact that Jesus is God himself and he is the creator and healer and giver of life. Amen. Thank you both for such inspiring comments on our lesson. Let's now look at our memory text for the week. John 11, verse 25 and 26. It said, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? What is John telling us here in this memory text? I see coming out here, John was taking the sisters, more so Martha, to another other spiritual level we could see from the conversation the first question she asked him was lord if you had been here lazarus would have died and jesus now taking his time very measured very meticulous in saying to her your brother shall rise again 
Martha believed in the resurrection. So we see that some level she is spiritually sound. She represents all of us. You know, we have some spiritual knowledge, but we need to learn more. So Martha is saying, I know that he shall rise in the resurrection at the last day. I know that. So she believed in the second resurrection. However, Jesus now embraced her with this aspect of who he is. I am the resurrection and the life. And that was taking her on another level. And I think this is what speaks to all of us as Christians. We will ne never know everything. This is why we come together. This is why we study. And we have to continue to study until Jesus comes our call. So here is the Jesus. I am the resurrection and the life. And, you know, he went on to say the other things. If anyone believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live and all these sort of things. She understood up to a certain point. She believed that one day Lazarus would have been resurrected. And that is at the resurrection. And many of us as Christians, we start to look forward for that time when something would have happened. But here is it. The light of the world was with them. The resurrector, the resurrection was with them. And Jesus just needed to give them a better understanding that he is is divine he is god and with him the, he's the light of the world and once we believe all things are possible okay just to add a little bit to what elder god said now jesus was deliberate and he was intentional with everything that he did now martha's reaction was part of the reason why jesus had to perform these miracles because you see jesus came and none of them really knew who jesus was and if you look at jesus's reaction when he first got the message about Lazarus' sick illness, the way I read it is that Jesus deliberately delayed because he wanted to convey something. All of this was a part of helping them to understand that he is indeed the Messiah. And the raising of Lazarus provided su such an opportunity. Yes, as Elder Gordon said, she believed in the resurrection, but apparently she didn't quite believe that Jesus could raise him there and then, or he had the power to raise him there and then. So Jesus was quite intentional in what he did. And it was all in an effort to convey to them that indeed he's the Messiah. He's the light sent from God to the world. Amen. We now jump into today's discussion, healing the blind, healing of the blind man part one. And the story takes us to John 9, verses 1 to 16. I'll just read some aspects of it because it's a very interesting story. We see controversies coming out of this story. But nonetheless, let's take a look at what John says about this particular story. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents, that he was born blind. Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Silo, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seen. Therefore, the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, is not this who sat, he who sat and begged? Some said, this is he. Others said, he is like him. He said, I am he. Therefore, they said to him, how were your eyes opened? He answered and said, a man called Jesus made clay and anoint my eyes and said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received sight. Then they said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Now it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also made him again, asked him again how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put clay on my eyes and i washed and i see therefore some of the pharisees said this man is not from god because he does not keep the sabbath others said how can a man who is a sinner do such signs and there was a division among them so we have a lot to talk about this story 
And so I just read John 9, 1 to 16. So what did the disciples think was the cause of this man's blindness? And how did Jesus correct their false beliefs? And before you guys answer, I will always remind us that even today, people assume that if you're sick, it has to do because your parents or you did some kind of sin. So talk to us this morning. I, of course, they thought that the sickness had something to do with some sin that was committed. And it is strange. I, I think we should find it strange. When they ask the question, did this man parents sin or did he sin? No, before birth. No, he was in the womb. What kind of sin could this babe, this embryo, this zygote in the womb could have committed? I think they were so drunk with tradition and belief and were so misguided that even in a context like this, you're going to ask the question, what, if this man sinned while he was in the womb, why he was born blind or his parents? So we see what was happening there. It was the common notion that once something bad happens, once you're sick, especially sick with some dire disease, blindness, something that leads to poverty or brings on poverty, that you were aligned, you were cast aside, you were deemed less than. And so Jesus wanted to change that misguided concept that they had at the time. And here is it. It is the disciples who are asking the question. So which means those who were in Jesus' inner circle, they also bought into what was common at the time. Well, what we see happening here, and we also see the illustration with Job. His friends thought that he committed some grievous sin. So the, the Job's friend was also asking him, no, examine yourself, Job. You probably did something back then. That's so go back in the archives and try to find out what is it that you did. So we see that happening, but Jesus... And this is what we love about Jesus. He took time to strip the layers of misconception that is within our minds so that he can emancipate us spiritually, so that we can have the spiritual eyesight. So he said, neither the man's parents nor the man, the baby in the womb committed sin. But certain things happen in this particular situation God is going to show, and you see the whole topic, the whole divinity, God is going to show them through this man's sickness that he is God. So it points really to Jesus and what Jesus is able to do. Okay, if I, if I may just make a contribution here. Yes, they believe that even the disciples, that because of, he was suffering because of some sin or sins that he might have committed. But I want to focus a little bit on what the man must have felt. Because even the, the blind man also would have believed that it, it was because of his sins, rather, why he was sick. And because of that belief in his society, would have been looking at him strangely as a sinner. And so he would have suffered not only his physical sickness, but he would have suffered mentally. He would have suffered spiritually because he was thinking, look, something is wrong with him spiritually. And then the point I really want to get at is how much he must, must have loved Jesus. Jesus having come and relieved him from all of that suffering. And that is what Jesus is all about. That is what he was then. And that is what he's all about today. He's still in the business of relieving people from their sufferings. So I trust that we too, as we look at these stories, that we would understand that healing is in Jesus, that Jesus indeed possessed the power to, to, to heal us physically, spiritually, and even mentally. Amen. I want to thank both of you. You know, the information that you're sharing with us, they're so profound, right on the money. You know, Elder God, and I never really thought of it until you said it, that they're asking, what did this baby do in the womb? You know, and that's just foolish, you know. And so rightly understood that they were steeped in tradition. And Jesus, you know, the master teacher, was willing to unveil his purpose, his divinity to his disciples. You know, as we look at this story, there are two striking issues. When we look at the discussion between the healed man and the religious leader, let's go there. You know, this man has been blind for all of his life. This man is begging. And whether they gave him arms or not, we don't know. But here is a miracle presented in front of them. This man now sees and look at how. Look at the people first. Because when they ask him, how you can see? And he explained to them, this man, Jesus, who clear my eyes, 
anoint it and now i see you know <laughs> this is how i see now and they took him to the pharmacy so let's talk about that Let, let's look at this question both of you you know as we consider the striking issues between the discussion between the healed man and the religious leaders talk to us about that and this is so i don't understand we have two situations here we are let's look at the blind man at least he recognized his situation as elder david alluded to earlier he himself thought that okay probably perhaps some dire sin something happened and this is his destiny this is how he is going to be when jesus would have reached him and spoken to him obediently and this is something contrary to the disciples or the religious leaders they were not obedient to god and so they seek to mastermind their own religious rights something that makes them comfortable but yet still lack spiritual depth and so this gentleman here first and foremost he asks Accepted. I am a blind man. I am poor. I am less than. I am considered less than. I am a beggar because of his natural situation. But he responded to Jesus obediently. The Bible says that he allowed Jesus to do whatever he wanted to do with him. Spat, you know, he did not, could not see what was happening, but he knew Jesus was doing something to him. Somewhere along the line, he probably would have felt Jesus' touch at him and obediently he went to wash and he could have spoken about it even when he stood up to the religious leaders he was not fearful he said i was touched by him and after i did what he asked me to do i can see there were some who did not believe that it was the same person some were thinking that maybe it's just not a person and he spoke up and he said this is me i am the person i was blind but now i can see and he attributed it to God, to the divinity, to the power. And I think God, Jesus wanted, as we're looking at the whole divinity subject, Jesus wanted to showcase to the religious leaders, to all and sundry, I am he that creates, recreates, and is able to do more than you, more than you can think, ask, or desire. I am God himself. A few weeks back, we looked at ironies, and it is quite ironic here that the religious leaders, quite unlike the blind man, were not able to perceive that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. As Elder Gordon articulated a while ago, yes, as a result of being obedient and coming in contact with Jesus and being obedient, he came to understand, he came to believe that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. He saw the light. He came to the conclusion that Jesus was indeed the light. But the religious leaders, they refused, I would say, to see it. So there who were the leaders. So as a result of him accepting Jesus, seeing the light, following the light, he's going to eventually receive salvation. I trust that we too will allow ourselves to be touched by Jesus. So like the blind man, Regardless of our station in life, when once we come into contact with Jesus, he can lift us out of our situation. And eventually, once we remain obedient, we too can have that eternal life. So the religious leaders there, Elder Andy, they were spiritually blind. So they too were in darkness. And the problem with them, as opposed to this blind man who was obedient to Jesus' call, they failed to respond to the call of Jesus so they could have come out of darkness into his marvelous light. Yes, Amen. And that, and that darkness is going to lead them to eternal death. If I can choose, I would choose the darkness that the blind man suffered, who eventually saw as a result of his contact with Jesus. You know, when I look at this text, John 9, you know, what amazed me is that they were willing to condemn Christ for healing on the Sabbath. No, the author of John did not let us know that this miracle happened on the Sabbath till verse 14. And I said to myself, here we have these Pharisees who are so steep in traditions and all they know is all the laws of Moses. And here is the law giver in front of them. And they didn't even recognize him. You know, they call, they say he can't be no Messiah because he breaks the Sabbath. He can't be nobody of God because he's a Sabbath breaker. And you know, it makes me think, 
as we get into our next question, that sometimes we can be so steeped in our own traditions as some Adventists that we miss some glaring truths in front of us. So what should this story tell us about the dangers of being so blinded by our own beliefs and traditions that we can miss important truths right before our very eyes? And we see that this is one of the platforms that Jesus did. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all speak to Jesus performing some form of miracle on the Sabbath day. And I think that Jesus intentionally did that to correct the misconceptions that we have or the addition that we would have added to the Sabbath keeping. Jesus himself said it is good to do good on the Sabbath. What is good? To see someone in pain, someone in agony, to release captivity. Isaiah himself said, this is why Jesus came, to, to release captivity, to break chains, to open prison door, to set mankind free. So we need freedom in Jesus. And what better time when we have our sanctuaries today, our churches today, and people are coming. We often say spiritually that the church is a hospital a spiritual hospital so if someone comes with a headache if someone comes with some uh, malignancy something that is what we, that is that will lead them to death what is wrong in the church pause and have a prayer session and when we have a prayer session do we have a prayer session with the intention of not seeing a miracle or we, is it just a false thing we are doing because if we really are praying we pray every sabbath and i'm sure people would pray in the congregation every sunday well, why do we pray for the sick in the churches why do we pray on the sabbath day for that to happen so we're praying but at the same time we're not expecting a miracle well jesus Jesus, that is why Jesus came. He came to set at liberty those who are bound and chains were broken, the blind received their sight, the lame could walk, and Jesus was excited. But sadly, we as the church leaders were saddened and ready to kill him and even deprive him of his divinity by claiming, as you rightly say, Sister Challenger, he could not have been the Son of God because if he was the Son of God, he would so respect and hallow the Sabbath that he we we'll allow this man to perish in his misery, even on the Sabbath day. But Jesus came to set us free. And he said, whosoever the Son of Man set free is indeed free indeed. Praise the Lord for that. Yeah, why is it so dangerous for us to be blinded by our own beliefs? I think we should start by ensuring that our beliefs, our belief system is based in God's word. And that was the problem with the religious leaders because if they studied the word they would have recognized that from scripture there were lots of prophecies that prophesied that christ was going to come there were prophecies that predicted some of the things that he was going to do where he was supposed to be born how he, how he was going to die so had, had they been good students of the word then their belief system if they, had they allowed their belief system to be based in god's word then they would not have taken the course that they took. So first of all, I think we must ensure that the Bible is our only rule of faith and practice. And any belief that we develop should be based in God's word so that we are all, we always, we would always be guided by God's word. When once we allow the word of God to guide us, we can never go wrong. We are all going to develop little traditions, even in our denomination, but we must be careful how we treat with those ensure that the word of God always takes precedence. Amen. You know, I don't want to hit us as seven Adventists, but we have been accused of proclaiming the Sabbath above all else. And my brothers and sisters in the other denomination alone, that's something that they hit us with. Now we know the Sabbath is important, but in all of the proclamation of the Sabbath, we should also proclaim the God of the Sabbath, his love, his grace, his mercy, and so, you know, it's the same God that we serve and love. And so I'm asking for your takeaways because we're out of time as we discuss this Tuesday's lesson. So give us your punchline, that one thing you want us to hold on to. That the Lord will help me, help all of us from that disease of spiritual blindness. We can be so caught up, so soaked up with doctrines and believe that we are on the right path, that that too can cause us 
to be blinded spiritually. I will, what I'm taking from this, the blind man was obedient to Jesus' call, Jesus' instruction. I, my prayer is that all of us will just pause some time, even with in praying, just pause and listen to the voice of Jesus. Because sometimes we could be going down a road, going down a path, and the voice of Jesus is asking us to deviate, to turn, to go another step. But we did not hear because we do not take time to listen to the voice of Jesus. My hope is that I will listen to the voice of Jesus. Okay, quickly, simply, I would simply like to say our topic this week says signs of divinity. I would encourage us all to study the sign, study the works of Christ, study his ministry. And I am sure that we are going to come to the conclusion that indeed he is the Messiah. He's the light of the world. And having come to the conclusion that he is the light, let us follow him. He will never lead us astray. Amen. Indeed, we have been truly blessed by Elder Andy David and Elder Jacqueline Gordon this morning. We ask you to ponder for a minute your actions. Here we have the blind man who, when he was told what to do, when Jesus called him, he didn't hesitate. And as Elder Gordon kept reiterating, he was obedient. So Jesus anointed his eyes quickly and his eyes open. Some of us this morning may not be physically blind, but we're spiritually blind. And Jesus calls us today for fresh anointing that may remove the scales from our eyes and that we may see him high and lifted up. So again, we want to thank these two elders, these two giants in the study on Whispering Hope for sharing with us this morning. We ask God's constant blessings over their lives, over their homes, and over their ministry. And to all of our loyal viewers on Whispering Hope, we are so happy that we are your choice in the morning. So until we see you again, we just want to say, God bless.